What if it rained food? What if Earth was a cube? What if we had nine lives? What if bits could fly? It's absurd. If money grew on trees, if we didn't have these, if we walked through lives slightly magnetical, it's absurd. Absurd hypotheticals. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Absurd Hypotheticals, the show where we overthink dumb questions so you don't have to. I'm your host, Marcus Lanard. I'm joined here today by just Ben Storms today, actually. Hi, I'm Ben Storms. Um, Chris cannot join us today, and I am recording this definitely from my um, crisis bunker because there appears to be an elaborate plot to destroy our podcast going on in the background. This is true. Yeah, so Chris, um, Chris has broken his ankle, which you may ask yourself, why is that how he's able to record a podcast? But it's because he doesn't have access to his recording setup or anything. Yeah, so we were supposed to record, um, so we, we planned for a break in the holidays, mm-hmm. and we're supposed to come back, come back strong, record a whole bunch of episodes right away, get ahead back on schedule. And then, um, yeah, so the Monday of our recording, and Chris's birthday, mm-hmm. uh, he had a great birthday surprise where he slipped and just totally broke his ankle. So he's out of commission. And then I'm like, all right, me and Ben can do this, no problem. And then I, on my trip back from Trinidad, had to spend the night in LaGuardia. Wait, not LaGuardia, yes. JFK. Sorry, the other airport over there. <laughs> JFK. Yeah, so, you got, so you got stuck at the airport, and then you got deathly ill. Yeah. Like, from, horribly, from, disgustingly yeah, ill. Yeah, really, really badly ill, to the point where, like, I couldn't talk in the middle of last week, basically. Um, so, yeah, stay safe, Marcus. Yeah, I think the only reason I was spared from this horrible fate was that um, I went to Chicago, and I imagine if someone was trying to sabotage me, all I wanted to do in Chicago was get a good old deep dish pizza, because I had not been before, mm-hmm. and you got to compare. Um, and so the plan was to get deep dish pizza. It did not pan out. Oh, <laughs> damn. See what I did there. Puns. <laughs> did not pan out. Uh, and the best I got was a... Terrible deep dish pizza at the airport, which I was told was not anywhere close to actual deep dish pizza. That's a shame. So I can only imagine my um, podcast ending life choice would have been getting the poison deep dish pizza that has been poisoned by our shadowy enemies. Right, yeah. The the dish of the deep that was sent by Cthulhu himself. Um, <laughs> Cthulhu's deep dish pizza with anchovies yeah. and calamari, I guess. Something like that. Also, uh, uh, fair warning for for both my co-host here and also uh, people listening to this. I am going to cough at some point during this podcast, probably very soon. I'm sorry. I'll try to move away from the mic when it happens, but it's going to happen. I'm still a little bit sick. Um, I'll try to edit them out, which will be interesting because I'm the one editing. So if this podcast sounds slightly different, it is because Chris also can't edit with his broken ankle because he doesn't have his computer. Yep. Um. So yeah, we're we're just in great shape. We're mm-hmm. just having um, a wonderful start to 2019. Mm-hmm. Really Do looking it. like positive, 20, over the top winnings for everybody. 20 uh, 20 fine teen up in here for us. You know everything's good. <laughs> 20 fine teen, everything's fine. Don't even worry about it. Yep, don't don't worry about it. We're all good. <laughs> all right. Um. So I guess we can just jump right into our questions that we have here. And our first one today is, what if you had to publicly announce all your actions? So, basically, whenever you do anything, you have to announce that you're doing it beforehand. And so, Ben, I want to get, get your take on this one, because the very yeah. first thing you have to do in the day is wake up. Mm-hmm. Oh. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hmm. Okay, that's actually a... I didn't really think about that part. So, yeah, there's a coin flip... Based on how this is implied to the universe, whether you just never wake up ever again. So, but I assume I think that waking up is kind of the end of sleeping. So as long as you say you're going to sleep, waking up is part of that. I would argue that waking up, like waking up itself, is not a conscious choice, as my experience trying to sleep in on the weekends has proven time and time again. Right. Um. So I would say that yeah, the actual waking up part. I believe would happen automatically. Yeah. It's not like, it's the same thing. You don't have to like tell your heart to beat. Right. Like, yeah, no, it's it's, things, things that are, things that are, are subconscious actions. I think still happen as planned. (laughs) It seems safe. Right. Now we come to the immediate second problem, 
mm-hmm. which is the question is how would you, if you have to publicly announce all your actions? Hmm. So I'm counting any anybody as the public, but you don't want to wake up alone. <laughs> Well, so I feel like this is one of those tree falls in the forest situations, right? Like, like I, I feel like even if there's not actually someone, or oh, I guess like how loud do you have to say it? I think you, I think you have to. Hmm. I didn't, ooh, I didn't actually did not consider this either. So let's let's jump right into this. So let's say you have to like somebody has to get your message. Oh, that really changes things then. <laughs> it makes things very inconvenient. I don't think you can do that, man. I don't think I think I think that the act of doing it's enough, dude. I don't know. You have to li- living with somebody is the easy solution. You just have a companion. Oh, I just thought or a pet. A pet does would work. a pet is gonna count your dog, your trusty dog companion who never leaves your side counts as the public. Mm-hmm. Uh, he is a dog in the public eye. He is the I guess to, for a dog to count as the public, he probably has to like get in a newspaper once. I don't, I don't know. I, I think, I think it's fine. I think just saying it, even if no one's around, should still count. I'm not going to lie. All right. Like, I, I think, I think that's, you're just, it's getting a little, a little too, uh, too far in there otherwise. Second solution, Ben. Okay. Hit me with this. Second solution is you have your Siri on all the time and you have it directly connected to Twitter. Hmm. And every time you say anything, it gets posted on your Twitter account. <laughs> and then that counts as publicly announcing it. All right, I have, I have another option for you. I have another option for you. So so what if you just Google the kind of shit that we go all the time and wind up on some sort of a government watch list and get your apartment bugged? Oh, that's good. That's Cause then, good. Because then it's, it doesn't even matter. Like, they're always listening to you. So you're always, you know, they will always hear it. It's going to be tricky to start a life of... I guess we can do Google searches, but if you start a life of crime, it's going to be definitely tricky. Right. If I don't you have think, to announce everything you're doing. I don't think, yeah, I think that that is, you're right. That is not, you do not want to actually go through with these things because, man, you're going to be pretty easy to see through. However, <laughs> all I will say, we did not, we were not, I assume you don't have to announce intention, right? Yeah, so you can do just your very, your actual physical actions. And right. Some things concealed. You know, so, so. That does that does give you a little more leeway, but I still think yeah, yes, going down an actual life of crime is going to be a pretty poor decision considering your very unique disability. Right, and then and then going further, um, you've managed to get out of bed. I think getting dressed is easy. Yeah, you're like I'm putting on a shirt, I'm putting on pants, and blah 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 blah. You put on your peg, you put on your your pants, mentioning you're going to put on one leg at a time, just like everyone else. Well, it's funny you say that because that's, the next thing I've written down is specificity. Oh, um, oh no. <laughs> so. If I go into the bathroom, uh, mm-hmm. and I'm going to grab my toothbrush, Yep. and now I'm going to start brushing my teeth, um, do I just say I'm going to I'm going to brush my teeth, and I can brush my teeth all willy-nilly, or do I have to be like, moving it forward, moving it back, moving it forward, moving it back, moving it forward, moving it back, which, if I was brushing my teeth, would sound a little bit more like, <laughs> right, <laughs> which then gets into some questions about the, you know, how public is it if people can't understand it. But um, I would say partially for that reason and partially just because otherwise you're going to get in a lot of trouble with, like, how far down this rabbit hole do you go? Um, I think, like, the category is enough. Like, saying you're <laughs> yeah. going to brush your teeth is fine. Because, like, that doesn't leave any questions as to what you're doing to a person, right. you know? If you can say – if you say you're going to do a thing and then do the thing and no one says, wait, what did you do? You're okay. Which is good because my if I follow up, if you had said you definitely have to do that, was going to be well. What if you have to take a sip of water? Yes, because <laughs> if you have to right. say the word swallow, you are really right in that line. Yeah, it's tricky. You're going to get skilled or dead, one of the two. <laughs> killed, killed or dead. <laughs> so you're you're going to be you're going to be terrible to live with. Yeah. Because one, you're going to be fucking annoying, and like, it's also going to be like because you're going to be the only one doing it, and like. I would hate to have a roommate who just like every single time is like, "Hey, I'm going to poop." It's like, well, right. good for you, <laughs> good, good for you." And you hear, "I'm wiping, <laughs> I'm wiping." <laughs> oh, it's gross! I need to wipe more. It's gonna be really bad when you actually. The worst thing is when you don't hear them say that. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Did you wash your hands? Yeah. You didn't. You didn't. You didn't say, say it. it. <laughs> no. You wash your hands? I'm about to lie to you. No. 
<laughs> just like a Twitter sn- Twitter screenshots of every time you didn't wash your hands. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, no, that would be terrible. Everyone would know every bad thing you've ever done. Yep. Well, that's okay. The problem coming up here might kill you. Um, because you finish your morning routine mm-hmm. and you head off to work. So driving's going to be tough because driving involves a lot of um, what you might call reaction time. Oh. And there's a, it's a while before you can like say what you're doing. Like some things are quick, but some like you definitely lose a second or two announcing every action you take while driving. How quickly can you say I'm a break? I'm a break. <laughs> I'm a break. I'm a break. I'm a break. I'm making left. Making left. I, I mean, left. I guess you'd, you'd get good at it. Like you would get good at it. So so I guess you would be faster than most people at saying you know I'm a break, or such things. Yeah, if we spent the next hour of this podcast seeing how fast we could say I'm a break, we would probably get to the level of you would be just naturally. Here's a question, actually. Does turning on your blinker count as publicly announcing your intent to turn? No way. No, no. You got you to flick down that blinker. You got to say I'm flicking down that blinker. Oh, no, 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 no. But you, you say that, but you then have to say you're turning. Or does having the blinker on say you're turning? Oh, well, it's a, it's a, that's an intent to action. Putting like once your blinker's down, you don't have to say it. Blinker, 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 blinker. No, blinker, I, I blinker, just mean blinker. I just mean like when your time comes time to actually turn left when your blinker's been on. Oh no, you definitely gotta say left. Really, interesting. So it is a speech thing. Okay. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a speech thing. And you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna I think you you were covering what um what your job might be once you actually yes. get to work. Yes, I do have. So I'm gonna let you go there. I have one. Well, I have one little thing over here that I'll talk about afterwards. Okay. But I'm gonna let you. I feel like we're in the day. Nope. Yep. That makes sense. I can just slide around in there. So I had, I had a few few ideas for, for possible careers. And no joke, the first thing I thought of was the person who gives things to a surgeon. Um, which <laughs> I don't know how like fruitful career that is. But you know, it's always like, it's like the surgeon's like scalpel. And you're like, give me the scalpel. Like that's a thing. I, I don't know if that's actually a thing or not. But like from, you know, medical shows I've watched, I feel like that is at least thing on those. Um, which similar, similarly, um, being a surgeon actually also works pretty well, I think. Um, yeah, actually, cause I, that's very good. I feel like surgeons do kind of have to say the things that they're doing as they do them, you know? Um, which will actually, there is actually one clarification I do need to make on, on the surgeon point, which is if you ask someone to do something in a way that, all right, so, so let me, let me pose the question. I'm going to ask you to hand me the scalpel. So if you say that, do you then have to then again ask them to hand you the scalpel or does that count? Hmm. Because uh, if it doesn't, things are going to get really annoying really quickly because it's going to go, I'm going to ask you to hand me the scalpel. Could you please hand me the scalpel <laughs> for literally <laughs> everything you need, <laughs> which is not I really... Like- so I think that's not the worst worst case scenario we've it's ever not. hit. It's not. It's not. It's not terrible, but but it is not necessarily ideal. And otherwise, you, you think of like like the, you know starting an incision, you know, removing the appendix, like all the things that surgeons say when they do shit. You're gonna be doing that anyway, so you're set. You know. So I feel like that's actually a, a reasonably good um, a good a good career choice in terms of of um, uh, sort of blending in while you're working. Yeah, because, um, like, I was thinking about, like, even if, yeah, I was like, you, even if you function, you're just going to be the most annoying coworker ever. Oh, like, yeah. Tippity-type it and tippity-type it and tippity-type it in this e- report. Exactly. <laughs> so that, that was that was my goal for the most, most of these. We're trying to figure out places where this, we're going to call it a speech tick, um, will not be necessarily <laughs> as, as unfortunate. So the next one I came up with um, was auctioneer, which is more of just, like, a drown it out sort of idea. So... <laughs> Auctioneer, so a normal person talks around 150 words a minute, apparently. Uh, Auctioneers do like 250 when they're auctioneering. So I think that just like the sheer volume of words you were saying, it'll be a lot less obvious that every time you have to like scratch your nose, you're like slipping that in there, you know? It's like, I feel like that'll really just like, you know, even though the things that you say will not necessarily be the most like smooth in your auctioneer patter, um, at least they'll be less noticeable just by like volume, you know? Um, so, I mean, it's, it's not, maybe not quite as ideal, but it does, I think mostly work. 
I also think you'll just be get you'll be naturally good at speaking very quickly because you'll need to do it. For this like is true. Driving and that's really true. Everything that you do, all reaction based things. Yeah, you'll be you'll be a fast talker from those. So you can just roll that right into work. Um, which apparently there was a guy, by the way, who speaking of people can talk very quickly. I can't remember his name, but um, the guy who apparently was like the world record holder for fastest talker. So I, I said that you know normal person like one fifty words per minute, auctioneers around two fifty really good bunch like 400 apparently um mm-hmm. this dude could speak at like 600 words a minute um That's 10 words a second yeah uh which apparently he learned to do it when it was like when he was in school they would make him read books out loud when he was bad so he learned to talk really fast to do that <laughs> that is the greatest fucking t- that's a good ass like, like superhero origin story right there <laughs> um, word man <laughs> yep not great or superhero the auctioneer Good, good origin, bad, um, bad power, but still pretty cool. Um, next up, I went with YouTube personality. My first plan was be Bob Ross, but there's only one Bob Ross so that doesn't really count. But YouTube personality, I think, still works. It's close enough. You like unboxing videos. Kids love that apparently for some reason, um, and just like it informational is- videos on YouTube. You know, there's a lot of options there. You know, tell people how to like do carpentry or something i don't know like but that's just you know you film yourself and say what you're doing to do it like that's what you do <laughs> can we can we talk for a second about why unboxing videos work because i've watched a few and like enjoyed them and i don't understand it is why. weirdly it is weirdly i think it's 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 there's something about like the weird just patter of nothingness you know like i watched i watched like a 10 minute video of this dude opening up like packs of random Japanese trading card games, but like all like these really super obscure ones. Like he would just go, he just like took a trip to Japan yeah, and bought whatever like the weirdest looking pack was. And he just went and opened all of them and he was like, couldn't read any of it. He didn't speak any Japanese. He couldn't read any of it. He had no idea what any of the things were. And he was like, Ooh, this one looks real fancy in foil. <laughs> but I watched this for like 10 minutes and I was like in the, Thralled. No, I can like, I can kind of understand it. There's something about I don't know. It is like the most pure form of just turn your brain off quasi entertainment there is, I guess. So are we just that trained on enjoying boxes being opened. <laughs> uh yes. I'm I'm afraid the answer to that is yes. Oh. Um yeah. Also my poor my poor brain. With with uh the YouTube line, you can also of course go down and, and do uh, ASMR as well. And you just, as you're talking about what you're doing, you just move in real nice and close to your microphone like this. Um, and yeah, you just get some nice ASMR going. It gives you a whole other avenue to go down. So mm. here you go. You can do ASMR. Uh, I'm about to give you goosebumps. <laughs> oh, that was, that was unfortunate. Um, <laughs> so next up we have uh, being a cook. I have watched multiple shows involving Gordon Ramsay, so I know how uh, kitchens work. And I feel like Gordon Ramsay particularly is very, uh, has been made very clear that communication is incredibly important when you are like a line chef. Because um, he always yells at people about that on Hell's Kitchen. So Tell me more about how Gordon Ramsay yells all the time. Gordon Ramsay <laughs> yells a lot. <laughs> it's kind of what he's known for. Um, he yells a lot and is also very nice, which is a really weird combination of things for a person to be, but he does it. So that's cool. And I'm happy he can pull that off. Um, I did spend about 10 minutes explaining to my dad, um, this past weekend about how Gordon Ramsay is actually a really nice dude. Oh no. Yeah. He seems so nice. I would love to meet him someday. He, he just seems like the nicest guy unless you're trying to cook near him. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, he just like sees, he's only seen like, you know, the kitchen nightmares or the ones where he's yelling yeah. all the time. And he's like. Yeah, fine. He's a celebrity cook. He's such an asshole. I'm like, actually, he does like this one show with the kids, and yeah. like, he's like paid like five random people's college tuitions, like because he met them and liked them. Yeah. Also, the thing, anytime he goes on like a morning show, he's always like super nice the entire time. You know, yeah, like it's crazy. Yeah, you know, he's a nice guy, but he also yells a lot. That's cool. But yeah, so you know, it's like you know, you have to yell when you're going behind people because otherwise they'll run into you. You have to yell when you're like starting to cook things because they know you're starting to cook them. So like, once again, like. These are things that apparently, at least on, you know, Hell's Kitchen, people are really bad about doing and Gordon Ramsay gets mad at them. But if you have this condition, you will always do it and he'll be super happy with you and yell at you slightly less. 
So that's cool. You could be a. You definitely can't pull any stunts in the kitchen too, because like if you drop like you know, there's no five second rule. For oh you. right, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. People know if you drop something because. Wait, if you're if you're in the if you're in the kitchen, does the public get redefined as the restaurant? Um. Ooh, that's kind of fun. That's kind of fun little like, like like you know, event cooking situation. Yeah, because like if I'm if I'm in if I was working in a kitchen, I wouldn't consider my fellow chefs the public. Hmm. I would definitely consider, you know, the public outside the public. I mean, that just means you work in a diner and you just yell out and like, you know, every the everything. You just yell. Would you go to a restaurant where there's a constant stream of the chefs talking about what they're doing to make all the food? Honestly, I probably would, but I'm also a crazy person, so <laughs> I'm, I'm a very bad demographic. To shoot yeah, for. like that's that seems to to be perfectly clear. Extremely my shit. So like. You know, I, I think I'd be cool with that. So maybe don't ask me. Maybe ask random people who aren't, you know, me. I'm going to have to pitch this on, uh, on like, Shark Week. Yeah. Or Shark Tank. Shark, Shark, Shark Week. Should <laughs> 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 pitch on Shark Week, too, honestly. This, this cover is getting a little stale on what they have right now. So maybe they'll take some new advice. <laughs> You got, I go in there with like my, my business proposal and I walk into the room. It's like, hello, I, I'm Bruce. <laughs> I, I love the idea that people show up to like Shark Week pitch me and think it's Shark Tank. And it's just like a very real problem Discovery Channel has. You have to pull the ultimate con and just like do a really good Shark Tank speech, like pitch that ends with it just being revealing that it's Shark Week. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good call too. Um, finally, one last career that kind of combines... Our last two options of YouTube personality and cook, which is being a celebrity chef, um, which seems like just a, a, you know, in general, a good plan for life. Um, but it's, it's really good because once again, you know, being a cook, there's lots of benefits from this. Um, you'll have a cooking show where you'll be telling people how to cook. So once again, you'll be saying what you're doing when you do it. And this is good because this can be your thing because every celebrity chef needs a thing because, you know, like Gordon Ramsay yells at people. Uh, Guy Fieri makes bad hair decisions. And, Paula, and you won't shut the fuck up. Well, and, and Paula Dean uses lots of butter and is racist. So, like, you can just be the guy who just talks all the time. So, this is really, you know, it's a good, it's a good thing. It's better than Paula Dean's. So, I think you could really make have you know, some some good success with this this, this strategy. Um, so that's my that's my last last career suggestion is celebrity chef. Uh, so you said you had one one last um, option or one last last comment on this one this last topic? problem problem one, la- okay. one last problem. All right. uh, and it's called laryngitis. Oh, no. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, laryngitis is basically... It, it's more, it's less of a, a disease and more of a symptom mm-hmm. where you lose your voice. Yep. And the most common cause of laryngitis, as you may guess, is overusing your voice. Mm-hmm. Which you may be doing if you talk all the time, all day, to do everything that you have to do. This is tricky. The question is, if you lose your voice... What what happens to you? Okay, all right, hear me out. We already have to admit that the act of announcing your action is not something you have to say you're going to do, because otherwise you get caught in an infinite loop and die. <laughs> <laughs> so that means that things you're going to do in order to announce your intent to do something, you can do without announcing them. So this okay. means that using your... Oh, this is tough. I'm trying to figure out how to like use the, like the waking up example. You could write on a whiteboard <laughs> next to your bed. <laughs> Hook up a little webcam. You have a webcam. Yes, yeah, so you have a webcam with like, oh man, you need like, oh, I don't know. I don't know how you make sure someone can, since watching it. it I guess it depends on, depends on how how public it has to be if someone has to actually acknowledge it or whatever. Because if it doesn't, you can write on the whiteboard and like stream it on Twitch to just all 24 seven. And whatever you write on there, you have announced and people could see if they want to, you know? So my thing of thinking about it was it might be generally horrible, but survivable. If the average length of your laryngitis is less than the amount of time that you can survive without water. <laughs> Because I imagine you just sort of go through your day, your voice is horrible, and at a certain point, you just lose your voice completely, and you just 
cl- you just fall down. Right. <laughs> and, you, and you just have to sit and wait and recover for two or three days before you can be like, I stand up. But the problem <laughs> is, water. the problem is like, like, how quickly does laryngitis go away if you're not drinking any water? I, I like don't know. Kind so, of important. It seems to be like the common cases are two or three days, but none of them really cover the sim- the scenario where you have like pretty bad laryngitis and then continue using your voice a lot. Right. Hmm. So you are you are just li- like riding this very fine line. Like there's just a bunch of scenarios I think where you just get stuck and die. <laughs> yes, maybe being an auctioneer is actually a terrible idea. Yeah, I think that I think that's where we gotta leave it though, because I do not I do not have a solution for that problem because all the solutions for laryngitis are just like wait don't till talk. it gets better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't talk and wait till it gets better. Well, if we don't talk, we will be waiting, so Well, we don't have to talk for the next couple of minutes because we are segueing into our middle of the podcast break. Alright, everybody, if you like to hear us talk until we get laryngitis. Well, then you can support us. You can leave us a review on your podcast player. That'll help us come up higher on the search results and have help more people find our podcast. You can just tell your friends about us and then tell them again and tell them again until they take your recommendation and listen to our wonderful voices. You can subscribe to our podcast so you're always reminded every time we come out with an episode. Those are all great things that you can do to help us out. Uh, if you have been listening to this whole first section about losing your voice and you had a great idea for it or a different hypothetical situation or we did everything wrong and you want to punish us for it by sending us a very very mean email you can send that to absurdhypotheticals at gmail.com you can tweet it at absurd hype h-y-p-e hype that is and that is where we'll be announcing publicly all our actions from now until the very distant future um we're not doing that that would be crazy (laughs) But, uh, yeah, that'd probably be the best two ways to get in touch with us. Com- comments, concerns, questions you want us to answer. All good things to send to us at all the things I just listed. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Me and Ben's special podcast episode with just us two. And we are going to go into our second question. And, Ben, I'm going to let you take this one. What if you had a lightsaber? Mm-hmm. Like the space movie. Yep. Stars, monkey, Stars old, War, I believe. Yeah, Stars War. The big old um, monkey and Indiana Jones mashup. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so just sort of quickly go over what a lightsaber is in case somehow you're both listening to this podcast and don't know what a lightsaber is, which seems, seems like a, really small a corner corner case if I ever heard one. But a lightsaber is, I mean, it's like a laser sword. It's actually not a laser. We'll get to that part. But... Think of it as a laser sword. Um, that's the easy way to say it. What it actually is, apparently, once we look it up, is plasma encased in a force field that comes out of a little handle. So it burns things and cuts through them real easy. It's kind of the What idea. is plasma, Ben? Plasma is a form of matter that is the other one that you get tricked on on science questions when you were in, like, sixth grade. Um, that's hot. Real hot. I can't remember anything about it beyond that. <laughs> I've written here in my my very good prep jokes. Um, so I, I have plasma energy, which is kind of like a gas, except that the electrons have come free from each individual molecule uh, because they're excited, and then I just have the electrons are very excited to be there. <laughs> wow, this is the humor you can only get from this podcast that you're listening to right now. I wrote this like a week ago, and now I just have a lot of shame surrounding it. And so I felt so guilty that it was even on my show notes. I had to just like expose myself. Right, like like if you if you didn't say it, it would actually be worse because, like, like you, you just you had to get it out there that that was the kind of thing you would think of, you know? It, as it would just be stuck in my brain in a loop, like a little tight. It would just go in a circle, like a neuron circle, back and f- around and around and around and around until I had to say it. Or yeah, it like, explode. like 12 episodes from now, you just burst out. They're just happy to be here. <laughs> the electrons are very excited, everybody. <laughs> and we'd just be like, what the fuck, dude? Like, <laughs> what does that have to do with anything? But anyway, I digress. Lightsabers and having them. So, very famously, one of the things that, that uh, Jedi, who are people who have lightsabers in Star Wars... Once again, I don't know how... I'm going to assume you've seen Star Wars. I just think that's safe enough that you at least know what a Star Wars is. Guys, like, 
I'm gonna oh, trust man. you I, on this one. I'd almost love it more if it wasn't so awful. If you would just like stop and explain every Star Wars all, all word, of Star like Wars. in detail. <laughs> and then so so a Je- what are the Jedi does? Oh, okay. So a Jedi is a <laughs> kind of like a monk. Yeah, but and he, he uses has the Force. Magic mm, what's the Force? Uh, mm. It's like life magic, but not like fairy magic. It's, right. It's invisible, and you can push stuff and be good at sports. Yeah, pretty much. Um, but we still digress. Uh, famously, the Jedi can use her lightsabers to deflect blaster fire, which, hey, quick digression, those are laser guns, but not actually lasers. We'll get to that soon. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, could you refl- deflect or, you know, stop a bullet from an actual real world gun? Um, so my first thought was basically, could you vaporize, could your lightsaber vaporize a bullet shot and you fast enough to stop her from hitting you? And I thought this was going to be a complicated question to answer. And it actually wasn't um, on multiple levels. So the first level is canonically in the Star Wars universe. I'm going to be a nerd for a second and push my glasses up and point out that uh, there was actually an an issue of a comic book where Obi-Wan gets shot at by basically guns and he tries to deflect the bullets and they get partially melted and hit his coat and burn him a little bit. So the answer is no, actually, in canon. To not be a huge nerd, or I guess just be a huge nerd in a different way for a second. Let's just think about this logically. <laughs> <laughs> so, a bullet is matter. I know, tough concept. You can't destroy matter. <laughs> so let's say that that this bullet, which is made of lead, is shot at you. And you put a lightsaber between yourself and this bullet. The bullet goes through the lightsaber. What happens next? Well, the melting point of lead is about 621 degrees Fahrenheit. The boiling point of lead is 3,180 degrees Fahrenheit. So regardless of what happens, you got three outcomes here. (laughs) One, the bullet goes right through it and you get shot. That's not good. You get shot by a kind of hot bullet. That's a bad situation. I'm going to tell you that now. (laughs) Two, it melts. Then you get hit by molten lead. (laughs) This is also a bad situation. I don't want that to happen to me, and you shouldn't either. That's still probably going to hurt you worse than if it was just actually a bullet. The third possibility is that it hits the lightsaber, and the lightsaber vaporizes the bullet. Now, once again, the bullet is matter. It's not gone. It just comes through as vaporized, like, as lead vapor that will be superheated. This is a bad thing. It would just, that would just be an explosion. You would just have an explosion. Right. An explosion made of lead. <laughs> a lead explosion. The name of my newest heavy rock band. So, so no matter what, if you quote unquote block a bullet with your lightsaber, you're still getting shot. It just may, may not be a solid bullet anymore, which is worse, guys. So don't do that. And then actually, from even, from, even from that point, even if you could like deflect the bullet would you be able to even try <laughs> this is the next question i decided to answer once the first one was answered much more quickly than i expected and i had to fill some time so let's talk about blasters for a second once again blasters the guns like the laser guns quote unquote in star wars are not actually lasers and you know this because the shots from them don't move at the speed of light they very noticeably take time to hit things um so some people have actually figured out how fast those move. So there are a couple of sources I use here. There was a Wired article um, where he went into the first Star Wars movie and looked at the speed of all the, the blaster bolts. Um, and he split the shots up into ground-based, which are like hand-held weapons, and space-based ones on like ships and stuff. Um, he did this because, because all the blasters kind of move the same speed on screen. When he figured out the speeds, the space-based ones move way faster. So the ground-based oh, yeah, ones... Guys. Yeah, the ground base screen's the same size, but space big, ground small. Exactly. Yeah, it makes sense because it's a movie, you idiot. It's special effects. Um, But the ground base ones we work it out actually moved at thirty four point nine meters per second, which is only about seventy eight miles per hour, Um, which is actually pretty slow. Like slow enough that you could, if it was fired from like you know hundred yards away, you could probably just kind of move out of the way pretty easily. Um, the space based ones were like thousands of meters a second because of scale, but 
The ones we care about here for like actually blocking would be the ground-based ones anyway. So that got us like 78 miles per hour. Also, Adam Savage from Mythbusters at one point um, did a thing where where they were trying to figure out if you could like dodge or whatever um, blaster bolts. So they looked at the, he looked at all the first six movies and calculated the average and got 130 to 135 miles per hour, um, hmm. which is faster. Uh, still not all that fast. Um, because it's a good point of comparison, let's talk about bullets. Bullets move very fast. Um, they move, it depends on the bullet, but around 1,700 miles per hour or 2,500 feet per second. Uh, That's which is fast, Ben. It's much faster, actually. Um, which gets to sort of the next next part, which is human reaction time. So oh, not good. Not I, so fast. <laughs> yeah, I actually, I found there's, there's a website that basically is just a, a reaction time test. Where they had like a panel that starts out red and change to green and when it changes you have to click um i did it five times my average was 261 milliseconds apparently the median reaction time was 215 milliseconds so i was a little slow but i was also sick so it doesn't count shut up i'm not gonna try it again to disprove it because i don't want to learn that i'm just slow um Man, just if you have a shitty sick body it's your shit it's your shitty sick body you don't have like an aspirational body that you can count as your reaction time i'm just pretending it, that you have to own up to that 261 milliseconds i'm pretending that when i'm not sick i'll be more around that 215 because i don't want to test it and find out i'm actually just slow well we've, i think we've already determined you're never getting better you've been poisoned by the evil ones who i have been sick to destroy for, our podcast i have been sick for like a week and although i am better i don't trust it um, so I'm going to use that median time though, just because I feel like that's a bit more representative number. Um, and also it winds up being more dramatic because even with that slightly faster than me reaction time in that 215 milliseconds, um, that average bullet that travels 250 or sorry, 2,500 feet per second, it will have moved 537.5 feet or around 164 meters. So in the time, this reaction time was just to click a mouse. So, in the time it takes you to just, like, realize that um, a thing has happened and that you should do something about it and begin to move your body, you have been shot. (laughs) So, even if you could possibly deflect a bullet, you couldn't. Because you can't do that. That's impossible. Bullets move really fast, guys. This is the lesson of today. (laughs) So, in summary... Yes. Fake fake Star Wars lasers, you actually probably could. Fake Star Wars lasers are actually slower than Major League pitchers. Um, oh, I don't know. I don't think they're... You said 135 miles an hour, right? Uh, well, cause the, first move, the first number I saw was 78 miles per hour. So that one. We're using, using that one. Okay, sorry, but, sorry. Yeah. So, fancy later mo- movie lasers move slightly faster. I, You are correct. Mm. This is true. <laughs> once, they, once, they, once they improve the special effects. Right, yeah. Once, once they, they started drawing a little bit faster. Um, so yeah, I was going to go into a thing about whether or not you could be like a bodyguard or something, but clearly you could not. It'll be really bad. <laughs> Don't do that, guys. Don't try to use a lightsaber to block anything ever. You will die <laughs> immediately because you get hit by molten <laughs> lead if you're lucky. So, hey, Marcus, what did you do? Yeah, so I kind of came in, ran into a similar problem where lightsabers are, um, well, the primary use in the series, again, is deflecting laser bolts or killing stormtroopers. And since nobody has laser guns, and attacking law law enforcement, or as I might call them, earth troopers, is Mm -hmm. not exactly what you want to be doing with your life. Um, So it is very good at cutting things, which is the second thing that you can do with it. Mm -hmm. So my first thought was, could you use it to cut down trees? Like, could this be a deforestation tool? Because it cuts very, very good. It does Uh, cut good. It's true. So I was like, my plan is, you tie it to a long string. And then you kind of like <laughs> spin it over your head like a lasso and see like a really big arc. And then you just like start walking forward into the forest, cutting down the trees as you go. Can I point out, this seems like a very bad idea. Just just putting that out there. You will want a rope longer, you will want a string that is longer than the height of the trees. <laughs> this is definitely one thing you want. That is, that is reasonable. This still feels like so, a very bad idea. <laughs> plus, it's also an ineffective idea because... I was like, hey, is this better than how we take down trees nowadays? And it is not. (laughs) Have you ever seen those tree machines? Like, it's basically like a 
truck thing, and it's got, like, an arm claw. Yeah. And this thing grabs the trunk, and then it just has, like, a saw blade at the bottom that just runs through it real quick. It just, like, grabs it, and now the tree is cut down. But it's not done. What it then does is it, like, turns upwards, and then in its grip, it feeds the tree trunk through itself, and it cuts off all the excess branches. Oh, wow. And so it's just a plain old, like, tree trunk. And then it cuts it to the right length so that it fits in a truck. And this all happens in, like, 25 seconds. Like, it's just so fast. Yeah, this, is, it's like, this is better than lightsaber-based uh, pruning. So... There was a problem with... So the lightsabers are not good for deforestation. So the next thing I was thinking was, hey, it's sci-fi tech. If we have sci-fi tech, we can do stuff like power things. Um, and so my first question was, how much power... How, like, how powerful is the lightsaber? How much energy is in that blade? Can you use that to do cool things? And so based on a ResearchGate publication by Luke Wilcox at the University of Leicester... Um, which sounds fancier than it is because I'm pretty sure this is a student, but I'm also I'm also pretty sure it's pronounced Leicester, but you know, close enough. It's like one of those funny cities near near Boston. Oh God, no. yeah, I live in Boston. I can't pronounce any yep. things around here. Why is it Dorchester but Worcester? Get your mind, get your story straight, guys. Anyhow, Luke went into how much energy lights here produces, um, and I think actually I really like his methodology because what he did was he went to where I think lights here got the most use, which is melting the steel door in episode one when Qui-Gon Jinn is trying to escape the gas or whatever they were doing. Mm, yeah. Because that's, like, really when it was maxed out. Like, it didn't just, like, slice through it. He had to stop and, like, go at a certain rate. And so doing the energy calculations of how to melt steel um, and how fast he was able to do it with the lightsaber in the movie, accounting for, you know, screen cuts and all that, the lightsaber is about, it missed the amount, the amount of energy equivalent to a 9,000-horsepower engine. Hmm. Which is pretty good, but kind of awkward because, like, it's you could like power your like it's more than any car, so it's like probably double like the best supercar as far as horsepower goes. Yeah, but it's not like on the level of like trains and planes and you know right yeah. things where we really need to power things a lot. So you kind of have this awkward thing where it's like I have a thing that is very lightweight and produces a whole like a bunch of power, but not enough to like do anything world changing. Yeah, and don't even. Don't don't talk to us about reverse engineering or something because this is space magic. Like there is no logical science explanation for any of this, so we well, are not you reverse engineering. Also, cannot this. even if you reverse engineer it, the what powers the lightsaber is a kyber crystal, which can only be found in the heart of stars and is. I mean, besides being a sci-fi material, even in the sci-fi universe, we would right. not be able to get it with our current technology. This is true. So. I, I sat on it for a while, and I think the best use for a decent-powered engine that is very light and sci-fi is just to make a space probe. We're going to make a Star Wars. So, like, if you just hook this buddy up, and I don't have the science to turn the plasma blade into, you know, an engine, but I think we have that tech if we tried. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm pretty sure we could turn a whole bunch of heat and, and, and plasma into, you know a moving part or heat or whatever you need to get things going. Yeah. So I was like, we're going to do a space probe. And because we're in a space probe, we can't um, recharge the lightsaber, which apparently was a thing in my <laughs> I came across. So people, like, there was a whole bunch of forums about people arguing about what to do with lightsabers, and people were like, well, the battery's going to run out. And there apparently are extended universe comics where there's, like, jet, the, like, I was part of the story arc. It's like, oh man, I got to plug into my lightsaber, <laughs> <laughs> which really I think puts into perspective some of the writing in the extended universe. Yeah, the quality of it. So my next question was, okay, if we're putting this on a space probe that might be out for years, how long is the battery last on a lightsaber? This one was tricky because neither in those extended universe books or in any of the movies that they really are like oh man my bad my i've had my lightsaber on all day it's really running low <laughs> there's nothing even to put it into a little bit of perspective right and like no one's ever replaced their lightsaber crystal because it was dead but i did find a way to calculate it because you see lightsabers are not the only thing in the star wars universe powered by kyber crystals 
the Death Star laser is also powered by kyber crystals. Okay. According to Wikipedia, and that is not me stuttering, Wikipedia, the Death Star is powered by eight kyber crystals, which is great. Good start. Problem. I know how many crystals there are, but I don't know how much energy the laser has. And then I found a, another article, somebody else doing a bunch of math, which was I was very glad for. Um, I believe it was also Wired article. I actually don't have the link here, unfortunately. It was probably Wired. I think Wired had a few. They had like a thing going where they were doing a bunch of Star Wars science yeah. calculation things. So they calculated the amount of energy that the Death Star laser would need. And I like how they did this one, too. Because basically what they said is, if you're going to destroy a planet... At the very, very, very least, you need enough energy to overcome the planet's gravitational binding energy, which is basically because the Earth or a planet has a whole bunch of mass and all therefore has a bunch of gravity, it holds itself together. Mm-hmm. So if you can overcome that binding energy, that would be the minimum you need to kind of, you know, to blow it apart. Otherwise, it would still just be a planet with like a melty face on it. <laughs> right. So I had, I have a number, uh, you know, just freaking uh 2.24 times 10 to the 30 second joules doesn't mean anything to anybody it's big i can tell it's a that. big i have a very big number about yep. the total energy of the death star laser but i still had a problem because i knew how much energy it shot and i knew how many crystals there were but i need to scale it down to a lightsaber and i did not know how big the crystals in the death star were ah yeah and weirdly, I assumed there would be detailed like death star plans like a book somewhere online i mean because the, they like to do that so Many Bothans died to get that information, Marcus. <laughs> I... <laughs> Sorry. That was a joke that if you haven't if you haven't seen Star Wars, that would mean nothing. And even if you haven't seen Star Wars like once, it's probably still gonna mean nothing. But like one person maybe just laughed really hard at that who wasn't Marcus. <laughs> I was say, it was me, Ben. That was it was Marcus was the one we laughed really hard at. I hope I hope someone else does. Anyhow, anyhow, um, so, what I was able to find was, do you know the animated Clone Wars TV show? I have heard of it. I have heard of it. So, side show that they made after all the Star Wars movie came out. And mm-hmm. they have a whole bunch of seasons. I actually like it a bit. I heard it pretty good, yeah. And in one of the episodes, the plot line was they were trying to start, stop an arms deal with General Grievous. And the arms deal was one of the Death Star Kyber Crystals. Gasp. And so, looking through that episode, I got a visual on that crystal, and it appears to be about 30 feet long. That is large. Well, it is the Death Star destroying laser crystal. I'm I guess, okay yeah. with it being large. No, it should be that big. You're right. And so, putting it all together, I have the size of the crystal. There's eight of them. I have the total energy. Divide a couple times. I have another very big number in joules. Um, so I have my energy density of a crystal. Um, then I can go to the schematic of Anakin's second lightsaber from Star Wars The Visual Dictionary to see that the crystal in the lightsaber is about the size of like a large marble. Um, maybe like three centimeters across. And so scaling down the big crystal energy into that little energy, I now can find out how long the lightsaber will last if it's on and full power all the time. And conveniently, it'll last approximately 50 billion years. <laughs> I don't know if that's long enough. I'm not going to lie. You know, Ben, you might say, wow, 50 billion years, that seems like a big number, but is, will it be enough? Um, according to physicists, the universe will end before then. So I don't think you need any more power than that. I mean, but what if we just want to be safe? <laughs> if you just want to be safe? Um, Maybe well, don't use a lightsaber. <laughs> Maybe put two lightsabers. There you and go. And then when the first one goes off, it turns on the second one. Get a backup. Yeah. So I have my space probe is going to be powered by a lightsaber. It has infinite time to be powered at max horsepower, 9,000 horsepower. So what is our? So how useful is our space probe? So I kind of just wanted to... So now I'm actually getting to what you can do with it. So the Voyager 1 and 2 space probes... Um, they're actually heavier than I thought they would be. The hmm. Voyager 1 and 2, both of them, weigh 735 kilograms. Wait, really? That seems... All right, okay. I, I... 
Yeah, it's, yeah, they're heavy. They're like big and heavy. Um, they're spaceships, basically. Yeah, well, actually, I mean, it makes sense, I guess. But yeah, I always kind of imagine them as like little rover guys. Right. Yeah, like, it's kind of like, like, like a solar panel on the back, and it was going to be like just barely getting anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I guess if once you're in space, you don't have to worry about it. So might as well just make it heavy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's not going to make any difference at that point. And even and even better. If our probe could even add a couple bit of extra equipment, like get that HD camera on there, because we can shave about 120 kilograms off of it by removing the uh, the three multi hundred watt radioisotope thermoelectric generators that power the Voyager. There you go. It's so much more of a sci fi word than lightsaber. It really is. George Lucas is not necessarily the greatest wordsmith. <laughs> <laughs> so. As a point of comparison, the Voyager 1, now um, a few years into its journey, is traveling at 38,000 meters per second. Off it, off its, um, like I said, three, three multi-hundred watt radioisotope thermoelectric generators. Mm-hmm. Um, with our lightsaber, we can hit that speed in approximately one day. <laughs> and we can just keep accelerating from there. This feels now, like overkill. I'm just going to go ahead and put that out there. It's actually not. Oh. So if you want to do um, – it's it's nice. So if we want to do things like go to Mars, for example, it's going to take us about 10 days to get one way to Mars. That's impressive. But what's nice about this is that we're always accelerating. So like even things that are further away, like Jupiter, for example, mm-hmm. is maybe like two months and, but Jupiter's, you know, is much further away than Mars. Right. Um, and then if we want to go all the way out to Pluto, it would take us about a couple of years to get to Pluto. Um, so if we want to go further than our solar system, the next best thing that we could check out is uh, Proxima Centauri, our closest star, which is 4.2 light years away. And that will actually only be 50 years. Um. Which sounds like a lot, but if you take our Voyager 1, which isn't really accelerating anymore, and it's going, you know, that's going 38,000 miles an hour, uh, meters per second, sorry. When we, in 50 years, our probe will be going 5.4 million meters per second, which is way faster. So, without our fancy lightsaber ship, we cannot visit our closest star with our current tech. But, I think the conclusion here is... I think a 10-day Mars trip with, you know, 700 kilograms of stuff is pretty good. Yeah. So, the thing I would do with a lightsaber is colonize Mars? <laughs> I think that's what I think that's what I would do. I will, I will, I'm going to be pedantic here and point out that if you're going to try to colonize Mars, you are going to have to stop when you get to Mars. And if you want to stop more than once... That means you have to slow down, which does just mean that your trip is going to take twice as long, but you do have to take that into account. Yeah, so I guess I could I could check it out and be like, oh, actually, you know what? You could just like the lightsaber is pretty sturdy. You could just send over the first trip a whole bunch of probe parts, and then just like run it into a space wall. And then it all falls to Mars' surface, and you just pick up the lightsaber and plug it into the next space probe that you spent the 10 days building and send it back that way. But wait, won't you then... Hold on. But doesn't each shipment have to just be more space probe parts? Well, no, because like, the space probe is 735 kilograms. That includes like all this instrumentation and all this nonsense. None of it is part of the... None of it is the bit that makes it go. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. So you have like 700 kilograms to play with. And this is just with my math. If, we, if you want to do other math, like if you want to make it... Oh, let's see if my spreadsheet's hooked up to... If I make it 2,000 kilograms, none of my numbers update, so I did not link it to that then, particular In that case, it takes invalid <laughs> reference days. Boom. Yeah, it, it takes hashtag circular reference error <laughs> days to get to Mars. But it, it's totally viable. I think with that much transport, it's totally viable to get to Mars. No, no, I agree. I think it makes sense, yeah. And with that bombshell of a conclusion, I think we end today's episode. Boom. Boom. And really, that's going to segue us into next week's questions. 
And by segue, I mean there's literally no segue into next week's theme. Nope. Because I cannot get from Mars to our Super Bowl episode. Where we answer, how would you improve football? And which Super Bowl mascot would win in a fight? 